Hi and welcome back. After a short gap, I'm back here uploading class videos. The topic I'm planning to discuss today is vessels and nerves of head and neck. Here, what I'm planning to do is to give you a general, broad, eagle eye view of the entire vessel and nerve network of head and neck. I will not be explaining each vessel or nerve or its relation and features in depth. For that, we will have separate classes for each important nerve and vessel. The aim of today's class is giving you a broad idea or eagle eye view of all the important vessels and nerves you will encounter in head and neck so that as a fresh first year student, you will get a general idea about all the vessels and nerves which supply various structures in head and neck. For people who are not freshers, this video can still be useful as a refresher or a ready reckoner in case of doubts regarding cause of any vessel or nerve. And as I know from your comments that you love 3D animated classes, this one is also a 3D animated class and hope you will love it. Okay, enough of introduction, let's move into the topic. When I say vessels of head and neck, it includes arteries, veins and of course lymphatics. And when I say nerves of head and neck, that includes the cranial nerves which supply head and neck. We don't come across so many spinal nerves in this region. So we will discuss the cranial nerves which supply the head and neck and autonomic parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves also. In this video, I will limit my discussion to the general course of most of the important arteries and veins supplying the head and neck and one major cranial nerve which supplies the head and neck that is the trigeminal nerve. As I told you already, we are concerned with only general outline here. Detailed discussion we will be doing in separate videos on each topic. Okay, first we will start with the venous drainage of head and neck. We will start with the veins inside the skull draining the central nervous system. Here, Inside the skull, the veins are termed as venous sinuses because they differ from usual veins in certain aspects. Cranial venous sinuses is another important topic. Uh, how, what are the cranial venous sinuses? How they differ from uh, the usual veins? We will see all those things in detail when we deal with that particular topic in some other video. For the time being, I will stick to the outline. Okay, here we have the skull. In order to see inside the skull, we will remove the vault. Here, what you can see is along the upper border of the fox cerebri. Fox cerebri is the dural fold which separates the two cerebral hemisphere. So along this upper border of fox cerebri, we can see a venous sinus called superior sagittal sinus. Let's remove one cerebral hemisphere in order to see the other sinuses. Here, at the lower border of the fox cerebri, we can see another sinus running along it called the inferior sagittal sinus. This inferior sagittal sinus unites with great cerebral vein to form the striat sinus. This striat sinus is related to the upper surface or the superior surface of the tentorium cerebellum, which is the dural fold which separates the cerebrum from cerebellum. This striat sinus unites with our previous superior sagittal sinus to form the confluence of sinuses. From this confluence of sinus emerges two sinuses, one on each side, called transverse sinuses, the right and left transverse sinuses. They make a S bend here called the sigmoid sinus. Both of these, both of the transverse sinus here make a S bend called sigmoid sinus. And this sigmoid sinus exits the skull through the jugular foramen and as it exits the skull, it is called internal jugular vein. There is another sinus here at the border of lesser wing of sphenoid called sphenoparietal sinus. This opens into a pair of sinuses on either side of the body of the sphenoid called cavernous sinus. And this cavernous sinus drains via superior and inferior petrosal sinus into transverse and sigmoid sinus respectively. Anyways, as you can see here, all the venous blood from the inside of the skull finally drains into internal jugular vein. 
Now coming to the outside, that is to the face, here supraorbital and supratrochlear veins unite to form angular vein. This angular vein continues down as facial vein. Here in this space called infratemporal fossa, there is a plexus of veins called pterygoid plexus of veins and this plexus is connected to the cavernous sinus inside the skull through a short vein called emissary vein. This plexus is also connected to the facial vein through deep facial vein. Now this forms a connection between the veins inside the skull and outside the skull. And this is significant clinically because through these venous connections infection from the face can pass to the brain and vice versa. Now this pterygoid plexus is drained posteriorly into the maxillary vein and this maxillary vein unites with superficial temporal vein to form a retromandibular vein. This retromandibular vein soon divides into anterior and posterior division. The anterior division unites with our facial vein to form common facial vein and this common facial vein drains into internal jugular vein. Now this posterior division of retromandibular vein unites with posterior auricular vein to form external jugular vein. So now you will see that the entire venous blood from inside the skull and most of the venous blood from the head and neck finally reaches these two major veins that is internal jugular vein and external jugular vein. This external jugular vein opens into the subclavian vein which brings venous blood from the upper limb. The internal jugular vein also after receiving a few veins like lingual vein, pharyngeal vein, superior thyroid vein, middle thyroid vein, occipital vein and after receiving all these veins our internal jugular vein also opens into the subclavian vein. The thoracic duct which brings the lymph from the entire body also opens here and now this subclavian vein is called brachiocephalic vein. This brachiocephalic vein after receiving a few veins like vertebral vein and inferior thyroid vein unites with the counterpart of the opposite side that is uh, the other side and now this is called the superior vena cava and as you might be knowing the superior vena cava drains into the right atrium of the heart. Now I will give you a heads up on the circulation of blood within the heart. The blood from both the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava reach the right atrium. From the right atrium, the blood moves into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it is pumped to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. In the lungs, the blood gets oxygenated and returns to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. From the left atrium, it flows into the left ventricle and from the left ventricle it is pumped through the iota to the entire body. This is the circulation of blood in the heart. Now we are in a position to move on to our next section that is the arteries of head and neck. Now we can follow the journey of this oxygenated blood through the arteries. As I told you this oxygenated blood in the left ventricle is pumped into the iota. The iota makes an arch here called arch of iota. The arch of iota gives out three branches.